Well, thanks for uh, coming out in the, the chill and the rain today, everybody. Uh, this is a, uh, a special occasion in a way because it's the, uh, the first kind of public talk on this new core area, Contemplative Science and Education. So it's kind of like our uh, little coming out party in a way for the core area. And um, <clears throat> where I want to start is by uh, asking you to imagine the brain as a Swiss Army knife, and the most fabulous Swiss Army knife you can imagine, lots and lots of tools. And it probably goes without saying that one of our favorite tools is thinking. And this is true, of course, for just about everybody, but particularly in, in academia and other places uh, where knowledge and the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge is a really important, perhaps even central mandate for what we do. Um, <clears throat> but of course, thinking uh, for many of us does not come without its costs. And it's uh, very important to mention that embedded within thinking, and in fact, many other skills that we exercise as humans, is something that is so fundamental, so basic, that it's very easy to miss, which is, uh, has to do with our attention. And this emphasis on how we deploy our attention, moment to moment, day to day, has been of interest to thinkers for, for really centuries and across many different cultures. And <clears throat> let me just emphasize one of these folks, William James, who in his principles of psychology noted that the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which could improve this faculty would be the education par excellence, but it's easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. So <clears throat> I would like to uh, hope that if James were to come back into the 21st century, he would be quite pleased with how things have evolved in, in how we are beginning to address this mandate that he, that he advocated more than a century ago. Okay, so I want to suggest that attention is, uh, you know, as, as easy as it is to miss, is really fundamental to a lot of things that we care about, both in universities and in societies as a whole. So for some time now, <clears throat> in a whole variety of institutions, we've seen this kind of movement toward a discussion of so-called soft skills uh, that go into performance and achievement and uh, well-being. And I want to suggest that in a lot of ways, these so-called soft skills really have at the root a fundamental interest in attention. So for example, emotion, whether we experience emotion or not, is dependent very centrally on what we pay attention to and how we pay attention to those things, whether it's done in a an objective, clear-minded way, for example, or a biased or ruminative kind of way. Um, similarly, motivation is really about, the, at its root, the voluntary direction of attention. And so when we're motivated to do something, we pursue it more often. We give it more attention. And similarly, how attention is managed uh, impacts our, our willpower or more broadly, our capacity to self-regulate, uh, which as we're learning is a, a very powerful predictor of life outcomes. And our attention capacities are, are limited, but we can exercise and deepen those capacities perhaps to better marshal that limited attention to self-regulate more effectively. So <clears throat> this is really a uh, jumping off point, if you like, for contemplative practice and the study of it and the promulgation of, if you like, in science and education. And we can call contemplative practice uh, an experiential mode of learning in which we're exercising our attention in a very particular way. 
uh, because really what all of these practices do is they invite this very close observation of the phenomena that we experience, whether that's mental or emotional states, um, cultural productions, um, perceptual and cognitive biases, et cetera. And we could say more, uh, uh, to extend that a little bit, what they actually do, <clears throat> they can help to improve focus and attention, reduce stress and enhance creativity, aid in the exploration of meaning, purpose, and values, help to develop greater empathy and communication skills, supporting a loving and compassionate approach to life. Now that seems like a lot for, uh, for something like contemplative practice to do, or just, you know, which is really about the simple direction of one's attention. But again, uh, attention is really so fundamental to just about everything we do that the way I think about it is it can't help but impact so many different domains of our lives. So there are many contemplative practices out there. Uh, this is just one example of uh, how those have been organized in the so-called tree of contemplative practices that may involve um, movement-based kinds of practices like walking meditation or yoga or dance or even martial arts. Uh, they could involve relational kinds of practices about deep listening or dialogue. Uh, they can involve uh, stillness-based practices like meditation or uh, uh, visualization and loving kindness as generative kinds of practices and a whole host of others. In fact, uh, I, I wanna suggest that there's probably like no activity that we do in our lives that we could not bring this contemplative mind to bear on. And uh, so in a sense, anything can become a, a contemplative exercise. All right, so there's been a lot of interest in <clears throat> contemporary practice in recent years, as you may know. Uh, and a lot of that interest has been in mindfulness and mindfulness meditation. These are just some examples from the, um, from the popular media. Many, many apps you can download to learn this kind of thing. And also, you know, many books. And to me, uh, one uh, indication that an idea has bled into the popular culture is when there's a complete idiot's guide to it <laughs> and a dummy's guide. And of course, not to forget the coloring book version. <laughs> so uh, there are also many institutions that are, that are integrating contemplative work into what they do. Uh, so this is uh, the Center for Mindfulness at University of Massachusetts Medical School, which uh, has been around for quite a long time and has trained up thousands of people in, through its program and, and uh, probably many thousands more through the programs that it, has, uh, that it has studied and found evidence for that people are doing all over, well, really all over the world now. Uh, it's also uh, moved into a corporate environments. This is just one program called Search Inside Yourself that was developed at Google and is now spread to other corporations around the country. Also, it has uh, made its way into schools and there are various organizations that are, are uh, training up kids K through, uh, K through 12 in mindfulness and other kinds of meditative um, skills. Mindful Schools is one that I'm familiar with in particular that um, to date has trained up trained up more than three quarters of a million students thus far <clears throat> across the country. There are also uh, organizations that are actively promoting uh, the, the integration, if you like, of contemplative work with science. The Mind and Life Institute has very, been a very strong promoter of this work and has particularly uh, uh, done a very good job at uh, supporting young and up and coming researchers to do contemplative science amongst its many other activities. So there's also been a lot of uh, increasing amount of research on various contemplative kinds of practices like meditation, yoga, et cetera. Uh, this just represents the increase in peer reviewed research over time. Also, an increasing number of 
uh, federal funded studies on these topics uh, <clears throat> really is kind of very, um, a very significant increase in the, the funding rates at NIH in particular. And um, I want to kind of give you a sense of like where, where does contemplative science come from? Because uh, uh, there are really uh, uh, some pretty important antecedents, if you like, or, uh, or supportive conditions for this work. And here's one way of expressing this from um, Robert Roser and Phil Zalazzo who are writing in um, <clears throat> a special issue in a developmental psych journal. And what they say is the emergence of contemplative science is a coherent amalgam of numerous scholarly, scholarly disciplines, including cognitive neuroscience, developmental psychology, phenomenology, psychiatry. It resonates with an interest in the development of human potential, new ideas from positive psychology, a renewed interest in the roles of culture, learning, and relationships and development across the lifespan and advances in our understanding of neuroplasticity. And I want to emphasize just several uh, developments within science that have really helped to set a very strong platform for contemplative science. A couple of these that um, <clears throat> a colleague in this work, Richie Davidson, has noted. First of all, uh, our understanding of the brain has changed very significantly over recent decades. As probably many of you know, uh, we no longer have this view of the brain as you know, a, a static, physiologically static organ. It's, uh, it's very regularly, perhaps even constantly changing. It's functioning, even its structure, due to changes that we make in our behavior or through environmental influence. Uh, through training and through other neural processes that can happen throughout the lifespan. And <clears throat> certainly a very strong theme within contemplative science is so-called contemplative neuroscience, which uh, is demonstrating really a whole variety of things. I could spend you know, just a whole talk just on what uh, this field is starting to uncover. Um, but one very basic idea, uh, but very important idea, is that how we, how we use our minds in a contemplative kind of way uh, versus a more narrative, conceptual kind of way seems to recruit very different parts of the brain. So <clears throat> with what I'm calling narrative processing here is really, a, a, in a sense, kind of like our default mode of operating. It's very conceptually oriented, where whatever we encounter out there or through memory, for example, is habitually filtered through our, our memories, our evaluations or judgments, other forms of cognitive manipulation upon uh, everything we experience. Experiential processing is uh, much different in the sense that it's a receptive, comparatively less evaluative form of attention that's marked by this uh, sustained, clear-minded observation of what's taking place. Now, another uh, stream of work that has been a support for contemplative science is our understanding of um, mind-body processes. So. <clears throat> We're learning more and more about how the brain and the body uh, have, have action upon each other in a very bi-directional way. And certainly one basic thing we know about brain-body pathways is that our levels of well-being are uh, supportive of our physical health. And the evidence is pretty clear on that now. But it, it suggests for uh, those of us who are in this line of work in contemplative science that cultivating well-being through mental training can change the brain in ways that can impact health-relevant physical functioning. And it also suggests, you know, going the other direction, that working with the body uh, through uh, 
yoga and other kinds of movement-based practices can feed back to impact the brain in very beneficial ways. And of course, this has uh, significant implications for healthcare utilization, healthcare costs, et cetera. A third stream of work, oh, actually, just before we get there, here's some, uh, just you know, one indication of, of how this idea is being put into use in contemplative science. This is uh, some results from a paper that David Cresswell and myself and other colleagues published earlier this year showing that people who received relatively brief mindfulness training, just three days relative to those who are in a active control, showed um, functional changes in, in brain processing which in turn impacted immune functioning, particularly in this marker with IL-6, which is a very stress-relevant uh, immune marker. One more stream of, uh, of activity in science that I'll mention is, is increasing emphasis on uh, what we call real-world behavior, or in other words, what people actually do out there uh, when they're living their day-to-day -day lives, um, not just what they happen to do in a laboratory context, for example, or what they happen to put down on a survey. And um, what this work is doing is trying to tap people's experiences, the events that they have, very close to real time. And it's expanding and sometimes even overturning our understanding uh, of how thought, emotion, biology, and behavior are expressed in day-to-day -day life. And one interesting example of this was uh, a study from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, a couple of colleagues that uh, was published in Science relatively recently, and essentially what they did was something very simple in a way. They, they invited people to participate in a study using their smartphones and asked them very simple questions, you know, semi-randomly throughout the day. What are you doing right now, for example? How are you feeling right now? And they, they found several things that were quite interesting that first of all, people's minds tended to wander very frequently. Almost 50% of the times in which they were probed, regardless of what they were doing. And secondly, uh, people were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they were not. And this was true uh, during all activities, <clears throat> both the least enjoyable and the most enjoyable. And thirdly, that what people were thinking about was a better predictor of their happiness than what they were actually doing. So <clears throat> this kind of work is really helping us to, to understand how uh, uh, contemplative training might impact what people are actually doing in their day-to-day -day lives. OK, so how is this relevant to higher education? Uh, well, we all know, and we've certainly heard this in talks in, in this forum uh, earlier this term, how uh, challenging it can be uh, to be a college student these days <clears throat> uh, with lots of mental health issues of uh, significant concern to uh, university administrators and counselors and others uh, throughout the country. And um, <clears throat> one one way in which the work on contemplative science is, has implications for what happens in college students is now a pretty significant body of work showing the kinds of outcomes it can have. And I'm just going to run very briefly through several of these that are of relevance to students as well as staff and faculty. And this is largely work on, uh, that's been done on mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, which is one of the main streams of work in contemplative science, showing that it's, been, it, it's associated with enhanced well-being and mental health, with better judgment and decision-making in risk and health-related contexts, with uh, relationship closeness, better social relations, and with better physical health. <clears throat> 
uh, run through all that very briefly because that work has been summarized in a number of places, including this book, which I have a particular fondness for. <laughs> and um, what is interesting about the work on uh, contemplative practice, and here I'm going to focus particularly on mindfulness, which is the work that I do, is how it can impact not only uh, the, the aspects of a student's well-being, the things that are very supportive of their academic performance and achievement, but potentially even impact their academic achievement itself. And <clears throat> this is a quote from Samuel Johnson, uh, who was, uh, as you may know, an 18th century philosopher who said this, the true art of memory, which of course is very important to learning, is the art of attention. If the mind is employed on the past or the future, the book will be held before the eyes in vain. And one of the areas of work that's being done in uh, the realm of mindfulness is about asking how can the way in which we deploy our attention impact our cognitive functioning, including, for example, our memory. And I'll just show you a study that we published earlier this year where uh, students were trained up in mindfulness, very brief mindfulness training versus distraction training, if you like, as a control condition, as well as uh, um, no activity control. And what we found is after they had read some text material that was very neutral in content, was not designed to be particularly interesting, um, and came back to them five minutes later, we found that those who had gotten the brief mindfulness training showed better episodic memory. Now, what episodic memory is, is this uh, capacity to apply the knowledge we've uh, attained in the past and apply it to execute current tasks or to plan for, uh, reflect on, uh, derive preferences for future situations. So in other words, very central to what it means to study, for example, to be able to take the knowledge that one has acquired and apply it. Johnson said something else that was very interesting, which is very much in line with what we are interested in as well, which is really asking, what is it about the way that people deploy their attention that can make a difference to their memory? And he said this, <clears throat> that what is read with delight is commonly retained because pleasure always secures attention. But the books which are consulted by occasional necessity and perused with impatience, seldom leave any traces on the mind. <laughs> and this may sound uh, particularly familiar to those of us who are in education. And uh, what we wanted to do was ask, what is it that about mindfulness that helps to encourage this better retention of information? And very much in line with what Johnson noted, was that those who received the same mindfulness training uh, that I spoke about a minute ago showed more uh, enjoyment of an interest in the text material that they were asked to read than those who were uh, <clears throat> in these two control conditions. And in fact, that intrinsic motivation, this interest and enjoyment in uh, what we do help to explain why those who got mindfulness training showed this better memory performance. Now, this line of work has been extended out by others. <clears throat> this is a, uh, uh, a study that was done by some colleagues who gave folks either two weeks of mindfulness training or two weeks of nutrition training. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then before and after that training, uh, tested them on the verbal GRE, working memory capacity, and what you can see in both of these occasions was that uh, those who received the mindfulness training saw so significant increases in their performance on both the GRE and their working memory capacity. Um, 
just very briefly, I'll note that this work is not just limited to those who are uh, in college. This is some work that's being done by <clears throat> a colleague of mine, Joanna Arch, who is uh, uh, working with kids in a high school setting and doing something very simple, which is before they get their tests, in this case, algebra and statistics, she gives them just five, 10 minutes of little mindfulness exercise. And that's their only exposure to it in the whole uh, class time that they have. And uh, what she's found is that, first of all, <clears throat> from pre to post training, their anxiety levels go down significantly in both of these courses. Remember, this is just before tests. And um, when she looked specifically at these AP uh, students taking statistics, those who got the mindfulness training show significant increases in their test grades. And both among those who had three or more uh, brief sessions of mindfulness training, and even amongst those who had received only one or two. So this uh, kind of work is really uh, getting people much more interested in this notion of contemplative education. And here's one way in which contemplative education can be described <clears throat> according to an authoritative source, Wikipedia, that uh, contemplative education is a philosophy of higher education that integrates introspection, experiential learning into academic study to support academic and social engagement, develop self-understanding, analytical and critical capacities, and cultivate skills for engaging constructively with others. So another way that we could say this perhaps a little more concretely is that uh, contemplative education really invites students to uh, embrace the, the immediacy of their interior lives as a means to apply that first person experience to what they're learning in their classrooms. We could also go on to describe contemplative ed as um, the inclusion of contemplative and introspective practices in academia that addresses an increasingly recognized imbalance in higher education, a lack of support for helping students to, quote, learn who they are, search for a larger purpose for their lives, and leave college as better human beings. Now, um, what we call contemplative education can look like a whole variety of things. It could look like traditional education with, let's say, a course in meditation thrown into the curriculum, uh, which is certainly a very good place to start. But it could also be argued that I think that uh, it offers potentially an entirely new way of understanding what it means to be educated in the modern Western liberal arts tradition. And I think that's the, uh, over the longer term, that's the, the promise, if you like, that I see for this kind of work. Now, it's, it's worth noting that contemplative ed is not new. Uh, it's very old. Uh, <clears throat> it's been around for a long time in a whole variety of um, cultures. And uh, probably for as long as people have been meditating, it's been difficult to do from, <laughs> at times. Because uh, it really is a skill that needs to be uh, exercised. And it's not easy. As much as, again, we may think of attention as just a given, it can vary very significantly in quality. And it can be enhanced and refined in ways that uh, have potentially a variety of salutary outcomes. Now in higher ed, uh, this is a movement that in recent years has really gained traction through uh, a variety of ways. Uh, here's just one example, Association of Contemplative Mind in Higher Ed. Um, this being an organization, Contemplative Mind and Society, that has been around uh, for quite a while, really been a vanguard in bringing uh, contemplative uh, practice into higher education. 
It's also uh, perhaps more telling, uh, spreading to a whole variety of places all over the country. So these are uh, a selection of institutions that either are uh, actively doing uh, contemplative science as part of a, an institute or center in some way, or that are, uh, are, are, that are bringing contemplative education into the curriculum through concentrations, minors, other ways in which students can make it part of <coughs> their education as a college student, rather than just something that they do extracurricularly. So we're now on the list course, and I uh, wanted to kind of give a sense of what's actually going on here in terms of uh, both contemplative ed and contemplative science. And let's go back to our uh, long-suffering student here. Here's something that <clears throat> uh, is being um, spearheaded by the well that a number of you, I think, know about. <clears throat> uh, I think the well is, is, has multiple kinds of initiatives that are designed to encourage mindfulness and contemplative mind in various ways. This happens to be one that's going on during finals. Um, in the rec sports, there's a whole variety of, uh, of yoga, including uh, mindful-based yoga that students can take. <laughs> And there's the Artfulness Initiative that is bringing this uh, idea into contemplative arts. And there are a whole, really a whole variety of kind of extracurricular activities that students can uh, take advantage of, including things that are happening at the well, things that are happening in the, through the, the new Thrive uh, residence, as well as a whole number of opportunities that are related to uh, uh, helping students in, in uh, recovery from um, substance use of one kind or another. So I want to kind of give you a sense too of what's happening on the science side of things. So uh, I noted that attention is really uh, an important driver of many things and it's become increasingly important in uh, corporate and other kinds of leadership contexts with this recognition that to be an effective leader requires really an ability to exercise one's uh, attention capacities in really a variety of flexible ways. And I just want to give a shout out to Chris Rina, who's doing some work in this area, who's uh, interested in mindfulness training to enhance leader and employee well-being and organization performance. And uh, there's a variety of researchers who are very actively engaged in, uh, in well-being enhancement kinds of research as well. Abigail Conley, who's also here, uh, who's doing work on mindfulness and resilience, protective factors, mitigating the risk of interpersonal violence, re-victimization. And she's also studying the impact of uh, contemplative practice on, on counselor preparation, including uh, through the teaching of this uh, graduate course, wellness counseling through uh, School of Education. Uh, Joe Robbins School of Nursing is doing individual and family-centered mindfulness-based self-strategy research for increasing cardiovascular disease risk among African Americans. Patricia Kinzer, also in the School of Nursing, who is interested in bi biobehavioral effects of mindful movement, uh, namely uh, yoga and related practices for symptom self-management. She's also very interested in, uh, in cultivating uh, well-being in um, pregnant moms and by implication their offspring through this new uh, mindful moms intervention that she's working on with pregnant women who have depressive symptoms. And Patricia, as well as George Deeb, who's in the uh, School of Dentistry, have for the last couple of years been conducting a semester-long course called Mindfulness Practices for Healthcare Professionals, and are also actively um, doing research to test the efficacy of that, of that course. 
Uh, Brian Meyer, who is at um, the VA locally, McGuire um, Hospital, who is studying mindfulness meditation for PTSD, uh, primarily for vets, as well as the delivery of mindfulness meditation via uh, telehealth and other kinds of distance learning uh, modalities. And uh, just before I end, and <clears throat> really where I'm ending is where we are, and uh, what I would like to invite is discussion about where we could be, because this is certainly a very young initiative. But let me just state here uh, how we got to where we are at this early stage. Uh, Christopher Geary, who is an anesthesiologist down on the med campus was really instrumental in um, helping to spearhead this work through informal conversations first and then more formal conversations. He was really a, uh, a strong advocate for developing this initiative. And also uh, Linda Hancock and Mark Cooper, both of whom are here, who uh, were very much a part of uh, these initial discussions that we had about what this thing was going to look like that we were developing. And also a couple of students, Jordan Qualia, who's now graduated, as well as Sarah Braun, who's still here, both in psychology, who were uh, uh, very important kind of hammering out the, the details of what this cannabis science and education core looks like at this point. And finally, I want to uh, just give a shout out to Danielle, who invited us into the Kobe family and also uh, Craig Zerpolo, who is very helpful in uh, developing our, our uh, web presence, and Tom Bernard as well. And uh, uh, thank you for listening.